We've been told to stay indoors for at least two weeks now. What impact is this global economic shutdown having on our animals and the environment? Hey guys, welcome to this week's edition of This Week in Ecology. Last week we talked about fake news uh, about wildlife returning to the canals of Venice and that got some interesting responses. It got quite a bit of um, anger towards what I was talking about. So let's dive a bit deeper this week and today I'm going to talk about the overall impacts that this shutdown has had on the animals and to the environment. Huge disclaimer, this is still happening. Where I sit today, I have not left my house in days and days. There are many research programs that have been canceled or haven't ga gathered enough data up to accurately assess the impacts that this shutdown has had on our environment. So I can't make any definitive claims one way or another beyond the science that I'm presenting in this video. It really is going to take us coming out and pulling these long-term research studies together to truly assess the answer to, is this going to help climate change? We need to be really careful about how we present our environmental information right now. If we are praising everything that is happening right now and saying that humans needed something to knock us down a peg and that it's karma, that just comes off to me as a very, um, unempathetic way to look at what is truly an emergency. I think praising the reduction in environmental contaminants and human disturbance to wildlife right now might be a bit misplaced. Um, it's totally fine to have hope and to look at the bright side of things and I agree with that too. But I think we need to be careful about how we present that information while still being um, empathetic to the people who are losing family members. We just have to be aware that we're not communicating this in too happy and happy-go-lucky of a manner. There's basically two impacts that we're looking at right now. One of them is the impact of reduced human activity, whether that's noise pollution, light pollution, cars on the roads, overall human activity on wildlife, wildlife movement, behavior, and mortality. The second thing that is useful to look at at this point in time is emissions and climate change. Let's talk about wildlife first. There are many circumstances where we're already seeing the removal of humans from the environment is causing a positive impact on wildlife movement, habitat, and mortality. There are different habitats or environments suitable for each species worldwide. We already know that wildlife often changes their behaviors in order to work around human activities and high times where humans are out and about disturbing animals in their environment. I know this firsthand because I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, I am a wildlife biologist and my senior thesis in university was actually studying the impact of wildlife movement and how it changed before and after humans were removed from the landscape. So I've seen firsthand that animals who had previously been seen around 3 a.m. in the morning because they were trying to avoid humans. When humans were removed from the equation, they started to shift their movement and their behaviors. So now they were coming out towards more of their natural time. And that is more of that dawn and dusk for many crepuscular animals. So when humans are removed from the environment, animals have a bit more time, a bit more freedom to move within the environment without having to have these avoidance behaviors there's gonna be much more energy returned to that animal, less time spent avoiding humans and being disturbed by humans, and more time spent foraging, reproducing, and living out more of its natural behaviors. So that's a positive. Now, the extent to which that is happening is quite debatable. Animals that avoid human urban areas may not be so willing to enter that human urban area if it doesn't have the proper habitat for that animal. I'm talking really generally here because every animal has a different ability to adapt to urban areas. Even when there's no one around, there's still a lot of concrete, not a lot of vegetation, 
little natural cover and sometimes little natural prey. Some animals may never really truly adjust to an urban environment that doesn't have its proper habitat. Even when humans are removed from the equation, they still are gonna need that specific type of vegetation or prey or habitat structure in order to thrive in an urban area, even devoid of humans. Our perception is changing of wildlife around us. So say in the morning you open your window and you hear a beautiful bird singing a song and you think, oh my God, the birds are coming back to the cities now that humans are getting off the roads. That could absolutely be true, but on the other hand, it, it could also be reduced traffic in the road outside of your window is making things a lot quieter. So now you're able to hear and notice the birds and the wildlife that were always there, but were drowned out by the sounds, the sights of humans in this environment. Especially since a lot of us are home and not working, we're actually out looking through our windows a little bit more. So it could be potentially seeing more wildlife in that way. But that's not to dismiss anyone who is truly seeing new and large amounts of wildlife because it can 100% happen. There is a mechanism for it. It would make sense that animals are going to go into areas where there is less humans and they're less likely to be disturbed. This is a really good outlook for our migration this year. Um, there's a pretty decent chance that animals are going to be less disturbed during their migration. And especially with the shutdown of economic activities, there might be a bit more open areas for those animals to rest and to forage without being disrupted by human activities. Especially with everyone working on their garden, there could be an increased availability of local and native plants for animals who rely on those, such as the monarch butterfly and milkweed. It's another benefit I could see happening with the shutdown. There is one thing I wanna to touch on with this because a lot of people are saying the water is cleaner in many of these areas that had high boat traffic before. So an example of that being the canals of Venice. Many people are saying cleaner. So if the canals of Venice are more clear, there's a reduction in turbidity and suspended solids that allows the solids to sink down to the bottom. And then that makes the water column much more open and clear so you can see little fish swimming around. However, that doesn't necessarily mean all these waterways are now clean. That's a really good distinction to make because fish are still gonna need clean water. They, they don't just need clearer water, but they actually need a reduction of those total metals and potentially BTEX, total petroleum hydrocarbons, other things that could be spilled from boats. They need a reduction of that and actually clean waters to thrive. And clean waters will come with a sustained decrease in boat traffic. However, it's not enough to look at a water and see that it's clear and say it's clean, it's good to go. And I don't think most people are doing that, but that's just something to remember. Cleaning of waters does take a little bit longer to implement naturally with a reduction in human activities. Now let's talk about the impacts of this shutdown on climate change and global emissions. There is a reduction in emissions right now and potentially into the future due to this shutdown. Literally factories that have been producing emissions are shutting down. So of course there is going to be a decrease in emissions. An example of that is in Shandong province in China. There are a lot of oil refineries. Oil refinery operations this year were at their lowest since 2015. At power plants, average coal consumption is at a four year low. As a result of these shutdowns, carbon dioxide emissions were down 25% after the Lunar New Year compared to emissions that came out in 2019 definitely a decrease in emissions in many areas where there are shutdowns. There are also fewer people traveling. There are travel shutdowns in effect all over the world. There is flights being grounded. There's a definite decrease in travel. Flights within mainland China have dropped 60 to 70% comparable to this time in 2019. And we're seeing those sorts of results all around the world. The clearest impact for many people is seeing the lack of cars on the road. Nitrogen dioxide is often used as a chemical marker for assessing the impacts that the consumption of fuel is having on pollution. Some of the hardest hit areas such as China and Italy are showing drastic reductions in nitrogen dioxide emissions during this shutdown. 
That corresponds to a decrease in industrial activity and a decrease in traffic. In some areas, nitrogen dioxide levels were 50 to 60% lower during the shutdown as in previous years. However, nitrogen dioxide is just one measure of pollution. Even during the shutdown in Beijing, unhealthy levels of air pollution were still being reported. Generally, this was airborne particulate pollution known as PM 2.5. According to the South China Morning Post, weather conditions were trapping this particulate within Beijing. A long-term cultural shift where we reduce our reliance on fossil fuels is obviously going to have a much different impact on climate change and the outlook for climate change versus a short-term reduction in industrial activity that doesn't lead to any long-term cultural shifts. I can't say that we're going to rebound back to the levels we were at before of industrial activity, especially considering that this economic forecast we're looking at is not looking good and it's looking like a lot of stuff is going to shut down potentially permanently. So there could be a more long-term reduction in pollutants being released into the atmosphere not just because of the shutdown but because of a long-term economic depression that leads to sustained decreases in emissions and that's really what we would need to see to make a long-term and significant impact on climate change. There is also a change in our current environmental regulations. When we're focused on healthcare, we're focused on surviving as a species, we are less focused on monitoring pollutants in a river. We're less focused on a lot of really important environmental conservation projects. And so that could have a negative long-term impact if we continue to lose funding towards those environmental conservation measures. An example of that is the EPA is now saying that they're gonna step back on their monitoring of contaminants in many projects. So there's gonna be less accountability for polluters in what they're releasing into the atmosphere when funding is cut towards environmental agencies in order to fund life-saving essential services. A darker thought too is the impact that overall population loss is going to have on climate change. You know, where I'm standing right now in March 2020, I don't know where the future of the world is going, whether we are going to see a massive decrease in human population just remains to be seen. Of course, widespread deaths are going to have a decrease in overall global emissions. Humans have implemented these drastic lifestyle changes in order to keep humankind safe. For humans to pool together like that and to truly implement techniques that will save us, gives me hope for the future of combating climate change. And if we can make these lifestyle shifts that might make our life uncomfortable for the short term, that gives me hope in implementing lifestyle changes that are going to eventually save us from the long-term impacts of climate change. I think seeing this massive emergency happening and it being due to the illegal wildlife trade and eating wildlife, the fact that the natural world can alter our reality and our economic bubble so much, I think could be really, really eye-opening to a lot of governments and maybe spur them or at least contribute towards creating policies that are for the long-term protection of wildlife and the environment because we know what happens firsthand when we do not protect those animals. Thank you guys for watching this video. Please click the subscribe button below if you are interested in seeing more videos like this one. And I will see you guys on the next video. Bye. Editing self here. I started a Patreon page for people who are interested in getting a bit more information about the environment, about wildlife, and having closer contact with myself. I wanted to recognize my first patron, Nariko Smallwood. Thank you for becoming a patron. I also wanted to acknowledge my first patron of the $20 and above range, Jay Pack. Thank you for becoming a patron. It means so much to me in these times for your support of small creators like myself. Thank you guys again for contributing and if you wanted to learn more about my Patreon, I will link to it down below in the description. Thanks.